Patrick. Uh, so okay. it, interesting to see, it, despite the fact that it's pretty new, huh, if we think uh, the, the democratization of, of space, uh, the, the fact that A, it is connected to uh, the Earth operation, basically doing so, we import the cybersecurity problems. So basically, if you are uh, active, you, you can consider that being space or on Earth, you have exactly the same type of problem, number one. And number two, as you've heard, there will be the creation of uh, infrastructure in space. Uh, the beauty, notably, of space is that it's cold. So uh, one of the problems of the data center is to cool them. So they, there you don't have the, the same problem. And then you can build this capacity in space. So we will replicate part of the infrastructure we have on Earth in space. But thus, uh, the problem of the cybersecurity uh, uh, will, uh, will remain, uh, as well as uh, of data protection. And then there is, of course, one of the main drivers that makes the link to our next uh, uh, panelist is uh, exploitation of data. It's one of the big area, uh, uh, commercial space. Uh, we know about GPS, and you will hear about it, and then exploitation of data. So, uh, Geoffroy, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'd like to start with a, a very simple question, legitimate one. What is the, re let's say, the link between cars, automated uh, cars, and connectivity and spatial? Actually, right now, uh, if you take a, a regular expression, which is, it is a smartphone on the wheels. And I think Tesla has been the first one to exemplify and show the way of the development of the new cars, new cars becoming software-defined vehicles, as you mentioned already. And it's, in fact, kind of a piece of a hardware which is connected. And this kind of connectivity is more and more linked to space. So this is exactly why we have today this conversation and why uh, we see car as a smartphone being connected as an IoT as it was designed and, and defined already uh, as being one of a provider of data and also a user of the data real time. Um, some examples, so we mentioned Tesla already and the link between Tesla on one side, so the cars, connected cars, with the Starlink, uh, which is actually the uh, uh, low Earth orbit, so the LEO uh, already mentioned uh, constellation of satellites launched by Elon Musk. And it's probably the first one where we have such a concrete connection between a car manufacturer as well as, let's say, a builder of uh, uh, satellite uh, uh, constellations. We have other examples, actually, uh, from other countries, such as Jili, so the Chinese manufacturer, also very, very interested in building his own constellations of LEO uh, satellites. Uh, and actually, if I were to <laughs> continue, there would be many, many examples that are coming. BMW uh, announced just uh, yesterday is willingness to, uh, to go a little bit further and to have some, uh, let's say, cooperations, maybe not his own uh, constellation, but to go further into that direction. And I think this is really uh, the trend. And at the same time, drawing the parallel with the smartphone industry, um, uh, Apple, as well, mentioned that they would also use for the next iPhones uh, this link between, let's say, their smartphone and the connection towards such uh, uh, satellite services. Um, why is that? Actually, because of those new cheap, I would say affordable, not cheap uh, still, because in the car industry, you have to be cheap, cheap. So uh, you have to be affordable to make that, let's say, volume-wise. Uh, but it's becoming really interesting in order to provide interesting business models. Um, the first one uh, being available are not safety uh, critical. It would be more like what you would call a connection of the last resort. So if you are moving uh, in places or rural areas where you don't have this connectivity designed by traditional infrastructures, this can be used uh, if you have any crash accidents or emergency calls or battery being, uh, being stopped with those new um, uh, electric vehicles and you forgot to charge it. So that, ha that can happen. So this could be, the, let's say, the connection of the last resort. And this is enabling with a latency that is okay. I mean, the one that we mentioned already, uh, which is roughly 40 milliseconds. Um, this, is, this is the kind of technology that is, uh, that is available, uh, let's say, in the near future. And if we project ourselves uh, a little bit beyond, uh, more like 2030, uh, it's, it's really where it becomes interesting. Not only providing seamless connectivity, but also, let's say, enabling what we call over-the-air, uh, let's say, development. Those cars will be, 
let's say, upgradable whenever, wherever you want, anytime. And, and this is exactly what can, uh, let's say, provide uh, the satellite uh, technology of tomorrow. It's also a link with the automated cars, because the car that we, we, we are designing right now and which will hit the road in the next uh, few years actually are becoming uh, automated, I would say. And this is really enabled by such uh, connectivity uh, devices coming from space, coming from these LEO uh, satellite constellations, where you can have very precise, um, um, uh, let's say, localization, location, few dozens of, uh, of centimeters, which used to be, let's say, really the paradigms of defense, and which is entering more and more, let's say, the civil, uh, civilian applications. Having, let's say, automated vehicles that can register and that can be age part of the, uh, of the ecosystem, you can also use it to enrich services that are more, let's say, uh, seen as broader services. Uh, which is um, uh, what we call crowd-source uh, um, systems, uh, where the car uh, can enrich maps, can give information actually to uh, many other uh, service providers, and cars are becoming part of uh, more global systems. Um, if I were to, um, to draw some uh, other examples, could be from the agricultural tractors where Vado, for instance, is uh, providing this kind of uh, connectivity uh, uh, systems or for mining applications as well. Uh, we stop at defense uh, for, for uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, anyway, um, there are some technical challenges which I, I won't bother you about, but very enthusiastic about the design of those antennas uh, that have to be really, really, let's say, um, uh, technologically advanced in order to connect at the same time with the satellites as well as with, uh, let's say, the traditional infrastructures. But um, if I were to summarize a few technical hurdles which I see very concretely right now. The first one is the standards. You cannot, you cannot uh, let's say, develop such, such topics if you don't have a, a global governance that is making sure that this technology developed by Tesla is also, let's say, available when you, when you develop it by another car manufacturers. And here, it's, uh, let's say, we, we can see that in the 3GPP systems and, and governance, I, I would say, in a positive way. By 2030, we hope that 6G will offer the first applications of, uh, uh, of the next release of the, the norms and standards, uh, making it possible uh, for such applications between mobile and, uh, let's say, uh, uh, cellular, cellular and satellite applications. The second topic is about cost efficiency. As I told, if you want to be to scale and, and to make sure that those chips are available for the automotive industry, you have to think volume-wise. And this is why I drew as well the parallel with smartphone industry, because actually we're using the same. And, and this is, uh, let's say, wh where, where I think positively uh, in this sense is that we will, let's say, getting the volume effect from uh, the smartphone industry as well, the chipsets, in order also to, uh, let's say, to embody it into the, uh, the car, uh, car industry. And last but not least, but I think we also uh, already mentioned that that's the cyber effect. We mentioned that those devices which are more or less commercially and, and from a civil perspective design are or could be a very interesting threats. Uh, I mean, when you take control of an uh, automated fleet, it becomes a very interesting weapon. So um, uh, this is why, anyway, let's say the blur, uh, the blurred frontiers between the civilian and the, uh, and the uh, military uh, activities when it comes to those IoT devices is very important. And that's where I think uh, we, we are all heading, having some companies, uh, private companies, let's say, owning uh, such constellations. It raises the problems that you already uh, uh, mentioned. So um, independence, of the independence of technologies is still, is still uh, let's say, the new frontier, even in space. Thank you, Geoffrey. And, and I think it's it's very interesting because we we heard with uh, before with Professor Suzuki with Daniel there is space and then space toward further the space. So we go moon, we go Mars, etc. But in fact, space is a is a is a is kind of a new type of frontier because then it sends us back to Earth. And and what you explain here, and probably this will be a topic for another one, is. Uh, uh, the uh, enablement of autonomous systems. And these autonomous systems will create uh, 
another set of questions for Daniel, <laughs> uh, because we will operate with multiple identities in autonomous system, because physically, as human beings, we won't be able to interact as you do today with your phone and an application, which is a basic, rustic, even I can say, uh, model. Uh, you will be part uh, your avatar of an autonomous system and space is enabling this, so sending us so... Uh